Good day ladies and gentlemen Medicine Access presents Sal's classroom the arena where you can learn about disease and their treatment Let's begin with peptic ulcer We will be looking into the definition epidemiology etiology and risk factors Before we learn about peptic ulcer, we need to know about stomach, the intestine and the esophagus because peptic ulcer is mainly affecting these organs. We do know the anatomy of stomach, however we can recall the structure of stomach. It starts from cardiac and it leads to the fundus where the, the food substances are stored, then it leads to the body then into the pyloric antrum through the pyloric canal it leads to the pylorus the wall of stomach is divided into mucosa submucosa muscularis and serosa the mucosa of the stomach consists of various cells which secrete various secretions the mucus next cell and the mucus and the surface mucus cell produce mucus the parietal cells produce hydrochloric acid the chief cells produce pepsinogen and gastric lipase and last but not the least the g cells produce gastrin the food then passes from the stomach to the small intestine where it first reaches the duodenum then into the jejunum and then last into the ileum the food then passes through the ileocecal sphincter into the cecum which is the part of large intestine now let's move on to peptic ulcer it is a sore that develops on the lining of esophagus, stomach or small intestine. It differs from gastritis and erosions in that ulcers typically extend deep into the muscularis mucosae. We have already discussed about different layers of stomach which consist of mucosa, submucosa, muscularis and serosa. The wound extends deep into the muscularis the third layer of stomach wall the pictures depicted here clearly shows how the peptic ulcer would be there are three forms of peptic ulcer the first one is h pylori positive ulcer the second one is nsad induced ulcer and the last one is stress ulcers Helicobacter pylori, they are mostly found in stomach and duodenum. It is also called as H. pylori. Peptic ulcer can also be found in esophagus, jejunum, ileum and also in colon. Now let's discuss about associations of certain disease with peptic ulcer. Zollinger Ellison syndrome, it is a rare condition in which one or more tumor form in your pancreas or the upper small intestine the tumor is called gastrinoma which secretes large amount of hormone gastrin as a result stomach gets more acid and this lead to peptic ulcer have you wonder how radiations can cause peptic ulcer two primary gastric lymphoma a type of cancer patients who are having refractory peptic ulcer with negative H. pylori infection. On examining his or their treatment regimen, it was found that they were having radiation therapy. Even though they were having treatment for peptic ulcer for a long period of time, the peptic ulcer did not cure as fast as a normal patient or a normal person as a patient was on radiation therapy. So this may lead to a mere conclusion that radiation can cause peptic ulcer. Vascular insufficiency. We present four middle-aged women 
who had long history of severe progressive weight loss and chronic abdominal pain. When they were analyzed endoscopically, gastric ulcer was present, which did not heal with conservative therapy. On further analysis, the patients had chronic mesenteric vascular insufficiency. Later on, the correcting, later on, after correcting the superior mesenteric artery and subsequent revascularization improved the condition of all the four patients. Have you wondered how COPD patients are having peptic ulcer? It may be due to the drugs that are used in COPD. Mainly they are prescribed with corticosteroids, methylsanthines and many other drugs. The corticosteroids and methylsanthine can enhance the gastric acid secretion. Apart from that, COPD patients with age greater than 65 years with male gender, comorbidities of hypertension, diabetes, history of peptic ulcer, the use of NSAIDs can increase the ulcer and subsequently the complications that is bleeding in COPD patient. This was a conclusion that was made based on a study published. When chronic kidney disease patients are compared with general population, the end-stage renal disease patients have more gastrointestinal symptoms and high prevalence of peptic ulcer. 577 chronic kidney disease patients were enrolled into a study. Out of that, 174 CKD patients had peptic ulcer. Those who have undergone hemodialysis were having greater prevalence of peptic ulcer than those who have undergone peritoneal dialysis. On analyzing the chronic kidney disease patients with peptic ulcer, it was found that they were having decreased level of albumin in serum and an increased level of blood urea nitrogen when comparing with that of those who don't have peptic ulcer. Patients who were having cirrhosis are more prone to peptic ulcer. Usually they are asymptomatic. However, 20 to 25 percentage of patients do experience complications associated with peptic ulcer. A peptic ulcer epidemiological study was conducted in India. They have selected the urban population. It was found that the peptic ulcer prevalence was 4.72 percentage at that point and 11.2 percentage had peptic ulcer in some point of their life. Men were most commonly affected with peptic ulcer of that deodorant ulcer was more prominent than gastric ulcer. Later on the trend changed to a situation in which men and women are equally affected with peptic ulcer. Increasing age is a risk factor for this con disease condition. So the geriatric populations are most prone to peptic ulcer. The peak was found in 28.8% of geriatric populations. This may be due to their physiological changes that ha happen in the stomach and the small intestine. However, whatever the case may be, the peptic ulcer can affect the quality of life, can decrease the work performance and also increase the medical cost. Now let's move on to the etiology and the risk factors. The major causative agents are, first one we have H. pylori, second we have NSAIDs, third we have cigarette smoking, fourth we have psychological stress and last we have dietary factors. H. pylori infection causes chronic gastritis in infected individuals and is usually linked to peptic ulcer disease. Majority of infected individuals remain asymptomatic but 10 to 20 percentage will develop peptic ulcer disease during their lifetime and about 1 percentage develop gastric cancer. 
an association between H. pylori infection and iron deficiency anemia has been established but cause and effect has not been proven and whether H. pylori infection eradication is beneficial is uncertain. In developing country, H. pylori prevalence is more common than in industrialized country and this can be correlated with low socio-economical level. The most common route of H. pylori transmission is person to person either by gastro oral that, that is vomitus or fico oral that is diarrhea contact which occurs primarily during childhood. Members of the same households are likely to be affected with or infected when someone in the household is infected. H. pylori can also be transmitted by the use of inadequate sterilized endoscopes. So make sure the endoscopy device is sterilized before performing the procedure. Now we present a flow chart which shows how a normal gastric mucosa is converted into a pathological state as a result of Helicobacter pylori infection. First an acute gastritis happen. This may be asymptomatic or symptomatic in nature. Later on it can become chronic active gastritis which divide into either antral predominant gastritis or corpus predominant gastritis with multifocal atrophy. The corpus predominant gastritis with multifocus atrophy can lead into gastric ulcer. With the influence of environmental factors, the corpus predominant gastritis with multifocal atrophy can get into gastric cancer. The antral predominant gastritis lead into duodenal ulcer and mucosa associated lymphoid tissue lymphoma. This mucosa associated lymphoid tissue lymphoma is also formed from corpus predominant gastritis with multifocal atrophy. The second etiological reason for peptic ulcer is non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. NSAID causes superficial mucosal damage consists of intramucosal hemorrhages within minutes of ingestion and progress to erosion with continuous use. However, these lesions typically heal within a few days and rarely causes ulcer or acute upper GI bleeding or gastrointestinal bleeding. A safe point is that the gastroduodenal ulcer develop in only 25% of chronic NSAID users when continuously used. However, it is important that NSAIDs are used for a limited period of time. As many as 2-4% to of patients with an NSAID ulcer will bleed or perforate. Advanced age is an independent risk factor and the evidence of NSAID induced ulcer increases linearly with age of the patient. The risk of NSAID complications is increased for patients with a previous peptic ulcer and may be as high as 14 fold in those with a history of an ulcer related complication. The risk of adverse event is greater during the first month after initiating the continuous therapy and remains the same throughout the treatment. NSAID ulcers and related complications are dose dependent but may occur with low doses of non-prescriptional NSAIDs and low cardioprotective doses of aspirin that is 81 to 325 mg per day. In a systemic review, the risk of gastric bleeding was less in case of acyclofenac, ibuprofen, celecoxib and greater in rafecoxib, melicoxib, diclofenac, more greater in naproxen, indomethacin and most greater in pyroxicum and ketrolac. NSAID ulcer and GI complication risk are increased with the use of multiple NSAIDs or the concomitant use of low-dose aspirin oral bisphosphonates, 
corticosteroids, anticoagulants, antiplatelet drugs and selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. The risk of gastrointestinal bleeding or complication increases twofold with corticosteroid combined with NSAID than with corticosteroid alone. Similarly, the risk increases 20 fold when NSAIDs are taken concomitantly or together with warfarin and up to 6 folds when concomitantly used along with serotonin reuptake inhibitors. The next etiological factor is cigarette smoking. Epidemiologic evidence links cigarette smoking to peptic ulcer disease, but it is uncertain whether smoking causes peptic ulcer. Ulcer risk is proportional to number of cigarettes smoked and is modest when fewer than 10 cigarettes are smoked per day. Cigarette smoking impairs ulcer healing, promotes ulcer reoccurrence and increases ulcer risk. Possible mechanisms include inhibition of pancreatic bicarbonate secretion and increase in gastric acid secretion. But these effects are inconsistent. Also, we don't know whether nicotine or other components of smoke are responsible for their physiological alteration. Next, let's discuss about physiological stress. A study conducted in 17,525 residents, out of which 121 had peptic ulcer. Those patients were followed up for 33 months. It was found that the lowest stressed patients or people were having low incidence that is 0.4 percentage of peptic ulcer when comparing to highly stressed group that was found to have 1.2 percentage that is 2.2 times greater than lowest stressed group. So this can be a correlation between stress and peptic ulcer. The last but not the least etiological factor is dietary factor. Coffee and tea can induce peptic ulcer, especially when they are taken at empty stomach. We already know that coffee and tea consist of caffeine, which is a methyl sandine derivative. Methyl sandine can elevate gastric secretion, however, it is less in comparing with theophylline. Next we have milk. Can milk cause peptic ulcer? A study was conducted which consists of two groups of patients with peptic ulcer. One was given or first group was given normal meal with seasonal fruits to be consumed daily and the second group was given milk. Both the groups were followed up for four weeks and then endoscopy was performed. It was observed that the ulcer healing was 78% in the first group that is those patients who were taking normal meal and the drugs for peptic ulcer. And those patients who have taken milk in their diet were having comparatively less cure rate even though they have taken the usual peptic ulcer drugs. Consuming spices can also induce ulcer. Alcohol can induce peptic ulcer because alcohol when consumed can irritate the gastrointestinal lining also it can induce h pylori infection thank you one and all for patiently listening the session and have a nice day